Well, good morning. I'd like to give a special welcome to any who are visiting. We are glad you're here to worship with us at Southside Bible Church. I hope you feel a part of the family. Next week, we're going to be doing communion. We usually do it the last Sunday of the month, but next week we're celebrating 18 years since the first service that Southside Bible Church has had, and we're going to have a lunch afterwards and just a sweet time of fellowship, and we'll go to the table together next week, and just going to be a really special celebration. So I encourage you uh, to stay around. I want 100% attendance to break bread together and celebrate 18 years of God's goodness to us. Uh, this morning, we're going to take back up in the book of Titus. So we're studying through Titus. If you're visiting, we're in chapter 2, Titus chapter 2. And as we are studying through this epistle together, last week I introduced Titus 2 to you. And in giving you the framework that God has given to us to make disciples. The church is structured and designed by God to birth us and to bring us into maturity, to grow us up into our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're not to stagnate and live lifeless, dead, ordinary lives. We're not to come and hear sermons and sing and just go home. There's so much more that God has designed for the body of Christ, a living, vital organism where we are joined to Jesus and His Spirit and one. In the Western world, I talk about it often, but social media and the like have caused us to be loners. Young people get together and they spend their, their time just sitting around on their cell phones. We, we've lost how to have relationships that become interdependent and grow and build on each other. We're so individualistic that preaching, uh, it's a preaching center. I come and I hear a sermon and go home. That fits very much. And it's time that someone just stands up and says enough. It's a lie. The church needs to follow her king and obey her, his great commission to go and to make disciples of the nations, followers of Jesus Christ. Then we will represent God to this world. Our lives and our devotion and our truth will put God on display and then people will take notice. There's a way that God has designed the church so that the body will cause the growth of the body. So that every part working together, just in our physical bodies, it will work as one and it will build us up into the head. Conformity to Christ is our pursuit that I may know Him. And it does not come in isolation, but it comes in being plugged into the body of Christ. And so this chapter is a call to the personal discipleship of each other. Life on life, growing each other into the image of Jesus Christ is what Paul is addressing to Titus. And so you've got to care about God's plan. And your brothers and sisters sitting in this church that need your gifts worked out in sanctification to help them grow takes time and investment and cost. Relationship, oneness, love, forbearance, perseverance, speaking the truth. This is what the whole New Testament calls the law of Christ, that now we are to love one another. We need the Spirit of God to lead us and strengthen us and work through us to be a body like this. Nothing else is acceptable. And so if I had to assess our church I would say we've done a good job at the doctrinal teaching and preaching, but I think we're weak in the body teaching each other how to live into Christ, how to live daily in a real vital relationship with Jesus Christ, how that looks day to day and the working out and all of its truth. Are we growing in it like never before? I'm hearing beautiful things happening all throughout this body, but do we need to grow more? I'd have to say yes, we need to excel still more and the body causing the growth of the body. And so let's go to the one who desires for his church, who wants to, to pour out grace as we seek to live these kind of relationships. This is the king of the church, the head, telling us, this is what I want for my body. So let's go and, and seek his face this morning. Father, we come to you, and it, just even that thought lifts our hearts. The reason we come with full access and accept it is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we can't praise him enough. We can't make enough of Jesus Christ. We are so grateful that you so love this world that you gave us this son. God, and we look to him alone for salvation. We believe in him. We treasure him. We love him. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the radiance of your glory, and he has manifested you perfectly. God, we thank you for this Christ. I pray this morning, as he has told us how he wants his church to be run, I pray, Lord, that you will give us vision, or that your spirit will lead and guide us and awaken us from selfish Christianity. God, but that we would be awakened to one another, or that as we are awakened to you, we love because you first loved us, we will love like no other that the world will take notice because they can't find this kind of a love anywhere else in this world, and it is manifested right here in the local assembly. God, I pray for this. I pray that Titus 2 will be being conformed in this church. Change us. Grow us. Thank you for what you're doing, and Lord, we desire more. We, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit to lead and guide us, to build each other up. Lord, I thank you for this, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, we learned in Titus 1 the role of the elder in teaching sound doctrine to the church. He's to be refuting false teachers and silencing them if necessary in chapter 1. The church is to be built up in its most holy faith, understanding the Word of God. In Ephesians 4, we're told that the elders then are to equip the saints for the work of service. The elders are not to do all of the ministry. The church, uh, where the pastor does everything, that is not it. What we see here in Titus is that the elders are to teach sound doctrine and equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. They are to grow up into the head, but the, the, here is the work of the ministry. It's not a program. It's a body that you've been joined to. Now you are to teach one another how to live day-by-day day godly lives that put the display of God's glory on display. That's what we are to be doing. This is why you have been growing and learning not just to be smarter. That can never be your end goal. But to know God in such a way that it transforms your life and your living and your dreams and your hopes. That now you pass that on to others. I can't do this. If the body does not do this, this will just become a very smart doctrinal church with no true impact for the kingdom of God. The world will not take notice of us because we will not reflect God. Our fellowship will just be around doctrinal nuances and never about teach me how to pray. How do I abide in Christ? How do I share the gospel with a Muslim as we learned in our conference? How do you have family devotions and teach my kids of Jesus Christ? How do I love my wife when she's acting this way? If we don't learn how to take these truths into day-to-day -day life to put God on display, we will miss it. These are the things that we are being commanded here to teach one another. This is not a classroom, but it's in a living room. It's not in a service, but in a coffee shop. And it's not so much in the sanctuary as by a bedside. Listen to the theme of chapter 2. God wants the church to testify to his name and his character. Teaching sound doctrine just flows through chapter 2. And I want you just to look with me. We're, we're going to enter in now to, to looking at this chapter. Uh, verse 1, but for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Verse 7, in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine. Verse 10, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Verse 12, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And then verse 15, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Here is our call as a church to help each other live lives worthy of the calling that we've received. We're to live out the truth of our doctrine, how to connect it to godliness, to the, to the life of God in us. We, we work this out together. And so listen to why Paul tells Titus to do this. Go back to Titus 2.5. Why, why do we need to learn this doctrine and pour it into each other and help each other know it? Well, in verse 5, it says, So that the word of God will not be dishonored. Verse 8, Sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. And verse 10, 
uh, showing good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of our God, our Savior, in every respect. And so our lives will either adorn the gospel or they will discredit the gospel. We will either show forth the glories of God or we will show the world, I don't want anything to do with that. It's so cool in the college group as I've watched young men and women, they're just kind of limping along a little bit in their faith. And you connect them with godly examples and encouragements and they just blossom and come to life. All my teaching in Romans for three years with them, it, it, just, it was laying a foundation, but they weren't getting it. And it was the interconnectedness of the body where someone begins to show them what it looks like. And I don't want to embarrass them. There's, I also won't say their names, but there's this married couple in the college group that I've watched as the men get with him and learn about living in Jesus Christ and knowing and loving him. They're coming alive. And his wife, as she is plugging into the younger ladies, they are learning what it means to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Doctrine and discipleship, the two are married. They go hand in hand. It's a beautiful thing that God has done for the church. So let me flush this out in our passage of Scripture this morning. So come with me, Titus 2. Who is Paul addressing in Titus 2? Well, it's, it's discipleship relationships. And he says, older women and younger women, and older men and younger men. That should encompass everybody sitting here, I hope. It's not very transgender friendly, but it's going to cover older women, younger, older, and younger men. And so everybody, you've got a role and responsibility in discipleship. This is addressing the whole congregation. So let's begin in verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine, Titus. What are you to do? Speak the things which are fitting. The the word uh, sound for doctrine, it's an interesting Greek word. We get the same English word from it, hygiene. Hygiene, which means what? It, it, It means healthy. There are nine uses of this word, and five of them are right here in the book of Titus. This is a call for healthy doctrine that produces healthy living. This is just Paul's theme throughout the pastoral epistles. The more I keep looking at them, we are told as well in, in these books that unhealthy doctrine produces unhealthy living. We saw this in chapter one that the false teachers were a big focus, and their teaching was upsetting whole families. They were turning people away to myths and commandments of men rather than the Word of God. And they professed to know God in verse 16, but by their deeds they deny Him. Diseased doctrine brings about diseased living. Timothy, in the end days, Paul says, they will not endure sound doctrine. And Jesus said, in the end days, most people's love will grow cold. There's a direct correlation. They won't have sound doctrine and their love's going to grow cold. Give them sound doctrine and truth and they will fulfill the law of Christ in loving God and loving others. And so we fight for this. Sound words produce sound living. This is just throughout our Bible. Titus, you teach sound doctrine. Speak the things that are fitting to sound doctrine. I want you to catch something I think is important. Paul, he does not say... Uh, Titus speaks sound doctrine. Remember back in verse 9, the elder, he is to speak sound doctrine. But here he uses a different word. He says, speak the things associated with sound doctrine, which is day-to-day living. John MacArthur said this, you can't just fill their heads with theology. That's John MacArthur. You can't just fill their heads with theology. He said, healthy teaching has to lead to healthy living. That is what Paul is after right now, and it's what I'm after in this church. You can't just fill their heads with theology, but you'll never get a godly life without it. The two are so married. In verse 1, speak, laleo. It means to talk, and it's in the present tense. Just, Just be speaking this sound doctrine Titus, keep talking about godly living and behavior that fits with the truth of the gospel. Don't get intimidated, Titus. Don't stop. 2 Timothy 4 says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Don't grow weary of it. Keep doing it. There'll be all kinds of resistance to holy living. 
The enemy will be happy for us to have all of our doctrine perfect and our lives are ignored and not changing it at all. He'd love that. We engage then and we help people see the truth to see the face of Jesus Christ face to face. We get in their lives to help them apply this into everyday living. This is a call word with the truth. Titus, you keep speaking these things. Don't grow weary. This is just a continued call to teach and understand the indicatives, the the finished work, what God has done of the new covenant, and the imperatives that come forth into day-to-day living so that we might be a pure bride. I want to keep teaching you how to live in a way that God gets the glory and our lives are going to be radiant and put on display, salt and light in a day that is so wrong. Verse 15, I love it, chapter 2. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Just keep saying it. Fight each other for holy living. Be a broken record. God wants a healthy church that adorns the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I feel like the church today in the West in many places has just focused on the quantity of the church and not the quality. We're so caught up in how to grow churches versus how do I teach this Word of God accurately and help each other live it. Verse 5 of chapter 2. He says, do this so that the Word of God will not be dishonored. This Greek word means blasphemed. I, I, I want you to live this way so that the Word of God will not be blasphemed. Who's it going to be blasphemed by? Unbelievers. If we don't teach sound doctrine and teach each other how to practice then the presence of God to live this out, the name of God's going to be blasphemed because of us. Our very lives are going to cause unbelievers to blaspheme God. Do you feel the weight? Do you feel this love for God's glory? I love His glory. I don't want you to live a life that falls into deep sin that causes the world to blaspheme the name that is above every name. I don't want the name of Jesus Christ blasphemed by Southside Bible Church saints. I don't want it blasphemed by any saints in the world, but I've got a particular interest in this local body. I don't want it to be blasphemed because of us. Your growth in maturing then is so linked to my heart because the name of God is at stake. Do you see why this just can't be me and my sanctification and that's all I care about? This is us. And we care about the name of God, and we care that it's not blasphemy, that every member is growing and being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Are you seeing God's purpose for the church? Are you waking up to your responsibility? I've had it said a few times since I've been in ministry. Someone told me, you know, I'm not, I won't come to Southside because one of your members cheated me in business. Someone cussed me out. I saw one of them drunk at a party. I'm telling you, the world judges the truth by the lives that are saying it. And I can't remember who said this, but it was an unbeliever, and he said this, show me your redeemed life, and I might believe in your Redeemer. 2 Samuel 12, when David falls into sin with Bathsheba, Nathan comes and, he, and, and reproves him, and David said this, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has taken away your sin, you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that's going to be born to you shall surely die. David, you've given the enemies of God a reason to blaspheme my name. We're never going to be perfect but I want to be blameless. And I want to deal with my sin rightly and I want to deal with it humbly. And we need the whole body working together for this to happen. I pray that we would join hearts and lives and grow each other up that the name of God would be honored by this colony of heaven called Southside Bible Church. Verse 10, he says that that we that we will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. We're to adorn the doctrine that God is a Savior. We have to live lives that show forth that reality. 
Let's put that doctrine on display, Southside. That all who know us or see us would say that church has a Savior. It's adorned. It looks so beautiful. I want that. What if I said to you this morning, I want you guys to come meet my personal trainer. He's amazing. Would you laugh? You should. (laughs) Come on. I'm a bad advertisement. My son's a little better one. What if I put one of those little car wraps on my car that's advertising Mazdas and my car's broken down on the side of the road? People are going to drive by and go, ha, ha. Or if you, let me advertise a vitamin that will make you amazingly healthy and I've been sick for five years. I have people tell me that all the time. This will make you healthy. How are you feeling? I'm not any better. Why are you peddling it? So I'm a Christian making shipwreck out of my life. It's a joke. And say, we're the church of God where immoralities reign and lying and gossip and we don't care about each other. You know what the world does? They laugh. They laugh at that. So how does God design his bride in such a way that the enemy wants our God laughing at what is a contradiction to our lives? So I'm going to show you in Titus 2, 2 through 3, God's going to now show, here's my design so that the the church won't blaspheme my name. There's a way that I I want it so you will grow and you will mature in your faith. Look with me in verse 2. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. And so here is God's design to not let that happen. I don't want this blaspheming to take place. But to ensure that we are growing up into Christ, who is our head. And so will you listen to this this morning? This is not the mindset anywhere in our country. What I'm going to go over right now, if I asked anyone outside the church, what do you think is the foundation and the most important thing to, to keep the church functioning and growing into godliness, they're, they're not going to answer older people. This is God's answer. God's answer to the church is older people. I guess what bothers me as I read this is that this isn't what's happening in our churches. You know what's happening in our churches? We are running off the older people. It's a young people's church today. And they they want new and exciting and all of the good things. And everything is done to attract young people. An age that is already so self-focused, we don't need to help them at all in it. I don't, they don't need the assist. They're already there. And now I look at what Paul is writing to Timothy, and what he is saying is arresting to our mindset and our culture, and maybe even your own mind this morning. The foundation of the church being a testimony to this world of discipleship, framing, and building us up so the Word of God will not be dishonored. It is on the older saints. It is on the older men and women of this body. You are are the key to the health of this body, says Paul to Titus. It's not the young people. They're the next generation. And we pour into them. But older people, it is you who are the health of this church right now. It is you that are to care for the next generation. We're a society that devalues age. I mean, we fight it with a billion-dollar industry, don't we? I mean, we will do anything not to look older. It's a billion-dollar industry. It's unbelievable. Nothing is more feared than getting old. Getting old is not appreciated. I mean, you, you have birthdays and you turn 50, and they sing songs to you like Big Bad Ken. I like the woman who said, I married an archaeologist, so when I get older, he will appreciate me more. (laughs) Paul says we are to appreciate the aged in our church. They are the cog that we need. It's not the movers and the shakers. It's the aged. And so church, 
if we're ever going to get discipleship and what I talked about last week, it's going to take us coming out from the thinking of this world to renew our minds that's opposed to this age. And, and they look down upon age and they see it as the great enemy. The world's view in the churches of the older men and women is so wrong that they're migrating south. And it's not just to be warm. It's that there's no place for them in society and especially in the church of God. I have a family who's mentored Laura and I and their family's all over the country. They grew up back east. And I, we said, why are you staying in Denver? They said, the church. And they're giving their lives to mentor young people. Do you see it as God does? These are the people that we look up to. These are the people that we learn from because of their experience and their wisdom, a lifetime of working on this doctrine into their lives. They've had a lifetime of doing this. Those are the ones that God has given to this bride. We're stocked with them here at Southside. There are so many sages, it's beautiful. Grown up, mature, living it out, we are blessed. One of my secret fears is Alzheimer's. I have it on both sides of my family, and, and I, I think I see symptoms of it every day in my own brain. I don't know what's getting older and what isn't. But I sat with a lady last week in her 80s, I believe, and she was just recently diagnosed with it. And she said, Pastor, sometimes I get scared, but I come back to my faith, and I am safe in the arms of Jesus. He's the one who holds me. Praise God for Rosalie, one of my heroes of the faith, just teaching me and modeling to me right there in that pew last week. So let's look at what the older saints are to be to do this discipleship ministry that God has given to them. Just being old does not make you wise. There is not value in being old without righteousness. And so this is a call to the older folks. This is what you need to be growing into and maturing into. And so Paul shows Titus what the older people need to be to play this crucial role then in the church. So if you'll look with me in verse 2, older men, you're to be temperate. Greek word presbyter, it's where we get the word presbytery. It means older. It was the same word. It said Paul the aged. The older men are to be godly. They're to be mentors and models that were pervade the congregation. Paul finishes his life and he says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. Give me those men who keep fighting the fight of faith and growing into the likeness of Jesus Christ till they breathe their last. Men like the Apostle Paul. And so older men, your first call is to be temperate. That word means the absence of overindulgence. It means moderate, not extravagant. It's people who have grown and learned the cost of self-indulgent living where it's all about you and it's all about your dreams and what you're going to make out of your life. And as they have journeyed, you've discarded a lot along the way. You've boiled life down into the things that really matter, this one thing. That's what we can learn from. The, when you're young, you accumulate. Now, now you know what has value. You see, all the energy that was wasted on the things that really didn't matter in life, you have filtered it out, and you now know what matters. And us young people, I, I keep saying us, I'm old, I'm 50, okay? So young people, you can learn from these people who have already figured that out. Sit under them, get coffee with them, learn. You've dreamed a thousand dreams, and now it's only Jacob's dream. You've just been through so much that life has been moderated. All the things that you thought would satisfy you, all the achievements that you went after and the accolades and all the things that now you've got a right value system and you know what matters and you're temperate. You have a simpler life. What has real value in relationships and what you pursue? You have a, a wisdom that needs to be passed down to the younger men and women. I remember when my kids were in Little League football and there's always the coach who mistreats your kids. Raise your hand if you've ever had your kid mistreated in sports. That is, that is only a couple. This is a bad illustration. 
My, my dad, I would talk to him about it, and my flesh is rising up. That How could he treat my little guy that way? And it would almost make me angry because he would just say, you know, son, they are going to learn life's lessons. There's so many things they're learning right now. And I'm just like, you don't get it. You don't know what they did to my boy. And it's just, there was so much wisdom coming down. And now I look back embarrassed going, why was that even an issue? The older men, their lives have been boiled down to the minimum of what matters. So older men, be temperate. And you need to be dignified. That word means not frivolous. It means worthy of respect, venerable. Life is a serious thing, and they, they've seen so much to just be kind of trivial. You, you, when you get older, you, you cry more than you used to, and you laugh more than you used to. You've buried your parents. You've buried friends, and you've buried family. You've been to cancer surgeries. You've gone through children who rebel, and maybe even a child who dies. You've borne the burdens of your life and your friends. And the world, you know, won't get any better. It's over this we are the world. We're going to make it a better place. Life is the way it is because of sin, and it won't be fixed until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. You just grow and become dignified. All these sitcoms on TV, I, I can't even watch them. When I was in college, that was my favorite thing, to hurry home and watch The Cosby Show or something. And now I look at them, and I, I just can't even laugh. They're not funny. They're not even funny anymore. I'm still funny. But this <laughs> so as you get older, you can still have fun. And I'm not talking about you're just a sour grape. But just the things of this world, they're not so funny anymore. It starts to grow and change. Thirdly, you're sensible. That means self-controlled. It means discretion. You can control your instincts and your passions. You have sound judgment. You know what a good way to say it is? You don't act like a kid anymore. Youth is marked by recklessness, thoughtlessness, instability, being impetuous. And the, the, older, the older man or woman, it's the opposite. You know, they're, they're just self-controlled. They're good, sensible people. Fourthly, it says there to be sound in faith, sound in love, and in perseverance. The word sound, it means whole. Sound in our doctrine and our outworking of it. So the very thing I've been exhorting in Titus 2, the older men and women should have this. They should have studied hard the Word of God and understanding it and knowing it, and they've learned how to work it out into day-to-day -day life. This is what they should be. They should be sound in these things then. So they must be sound in faith. We've lived enough that our faith in God is becoming unwavering. We, we've seen so much that I know God works for my good. When I was younger, I'd be battling, is this good? Is God working? As you get older, it's like, no matter what comes, if it makes no sense at all, I know that God works for my good. God can be trusted and He can be believed. Older saints get this. They preach it. They live it. They proclaim it. God has shown Himself again and again to them to be faithful. So older men, they believe God. Their faith holds up the church. You trust God. Be sound also in love. What is the, one of the most characteristics of people who are aging? They're bitter. They're bitter people. And what the church of God needs is these older saints who their bodies are giving out and there's a lot they're going through and they have the joy of the Lord that just can't take it away. I've got many of them here that bless me. Your love has matured and grown in discernment. You're just 1 Corinthians 13 kind of people. You love out of principle and not just emotion. You're more sympathetic than you were. It's just so sweet to watch. I know a gentleman who he, he couldn't rub two nickels together growing up. And now he buys young married dinners. He takes them, he buys them dinner, they babysit their kids. It's just beautiful what this love should develop and grow into. If the fulfillment of the whole law is to love, uh, a growing saint should be learning more and more, how do I love? And so praise God for these older saints who get how to love like few people I know. And then thirdly, they ought to be whole in perseverance. He suffered a life under the sun. They've learned patience. They don't lose heart very easy. Every time I've ever gone to one of our older saints in the hospital to minister to them, I always leave ministered to. 
like, man, I wanted to encourage them, and I'm just walking away skipping. They're, they're just they're tempered like steel. Their body and their mind might be weaker, but their will is strong as they wait for God's enduring promise. They're waiting for Him to come and make all things new. And it's just, that's the hope of their life. It's been boiled down and cemented, and they persevere through anything to get to that prize of the Lord Jesus Christ. You young guys and women, (laughs) girls, you need these kind of people. I need them. What a gift to the church of God, and it would be sin to not use them. It'd be sin to make this a church that the whole focus is, the music is so uh, given to 18-year-olds that they can't even sit in it because it hurts their ears. Some of the younger people, have you ever thought about that? Some of you like to complain about the, the worship. I, I want it to be the way I want it to be. And God's saying, here's the foundation of your church, the older people, and let, let's make it so that it, it, they can't even stand it. Just love. There's something beautiful here and I don't want you old saint, older saints to feel like you don't have a place. You're the foundation. And I want you to be respected and treasured. And we want you to use your gifts. And we're always trying to come up with ways of discernment for how you can use them. And so I, I want you encouraged. Are you with me? Younger men and women, do we need to repent for thinking wrongly about the older people? in the church, and society, your parents. And then to the older people is, have you listened to this crazy world that says you retire because Christians don't retire? These are your glory years to use your wisdom in the body of Christ so to unfold all that you've learned in the working out of this truth. Please get that. Don't retire. Engage. Get in with both feet to help the younger to grow, and to mature. Okay, that was good. Older women, look at me at verse 3. Older women, likewise, in the same way, older women, same deal, you are to be reverent in your behavior. That's a great Greek word. It means priest-like. It it referred to servants in God's temple. You're you're to to live in God's holy presence as you serve, kind of that Luke 2 with Anna kind of thing. And you're just to have this reverent behavior that's priest-like, where you're just reverent and you're serving God, and, and everything's about being in His presence with everything that you do. It's just, you get it. And so you need to have this reverent behavior. Secondly, you're not to be a malicious gossip. You know what the Greek word is for this? Diabolos. You ever heard that word before? That's the word for the devil himself. Don't, why would he use that term then for gossip? Because there's nothing more like Satan than slander. He's the father of lies and he's a slanderer. He's an accuser of the brethren. Older women, don't be that. Be those who have grown and matured and now teach the younger women how not to run around and gossip and slander and spread all of these things. Men, we we tend to be more rough and violent in our actions against people, but women like to do it more in their words. And so the beauty of the older woman modeling this to the younger women, how essential for the church of God not to malign the name of God than by being gossips. You start being gossips and slanderers and the world will hear it and say, that church is a joke. I don't want anything to do with God. All they do is slander each other and tear each other down. That will destroy God's name being honored so fast. And then thirdly, I don't want them enslaved to much wine. Wine is the in thing today. I read an article that they can't keep up with the production because of the, the, of the new millennial age. They drink so much wine, they can't even keep up with the production. Women who don't take their problems and their stresses out by wine that numbs them. And that's the heart of this is we want older women who you're going through a lot. You had hard trials. You're feeling pain. And to not run to the bottle for comfort. I'm going to just numb myself. I'm going to just take away my senses so I don't have to feel the pain. Instead of I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going to find him to be my comfort and my help and my refuge. So older women not enslaved to much wine, 
model to the younger women how to deal with the stresses and the difficulties of life through Jesus Christ, him satisfying your heart and him being the balm. We need older ladies to come teach our younger ladies how to do this. We need the older ladies to teach the younger ladies who are already journeying down the path of destruction that too much, too much wine will bring upon them. How they will behave and act for the name of our God. And so the glory of the place of the older saints in the church of God, here it is. If you have in any way been dishonored, forgive me right now. If we've dishonored you for your age and your, the beauty of what God has done, we, we repent. That can't be the way the church is run. If you have, uh, we, we need you is the bottom line. Godly young men and women are a dying breed. The next generation is not being prepared and taught. What it will do then is the name of God's going to be dishonored by this generation. And so it matters that they get discipled and we teach them how to live these lives that will honor and glorify God. The name of God is at stake. And that's our, that's our greatest desire as believers. I want him glorified. And so rise up, older men and women. Quit believing the lie of our culture. And, young and men, younger men and women, quit believing the lie of our culture and engage these saints. This is how we're going to grow up into Christ and how we will put his great name on display in the midst of this church called Southside Bible Church. So to God be the glory by older saints and younger saints locking shields and growing and teaching and learning so that we'll be built up into Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's give our lives to this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beautiful instruction uh, your word is always contrary to this world and its thought and its system. We don't want to be conformed to it. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. God, let us learn what you have for the church. Let us put off our culture. And I pray for the older saints that today they have been encouraged and strengthened to take the things that they've learned and being put on an anvil by God and ironed out, <laughs> hammered all these years God, I pray that their wisdom would flow in the body of Christ, that they would be honored in this church, that we would come to them and learn from them and be taught of them. God, let them be in their rightful place. And Lord, if there are uh, any of the younger who have thought wrongly about older people, that their, their parents are just kind of outdated and they don't come to them for, for wisdom and respect and they don't come to the older men and women of this church to learn, to to be discipled and counseled and, and just urged and hastened. God, I pray that there would be repentance in this church this morning. And I pray if there are any who, uh, they're older and they sit here and they're just bitter. They're bitter at you. They're bitter at providences. God, I pray for them this morning that they would lift their eyes to a Savior. We want to adorn a, a God who saves. And I pray this morning that they would look to a Savior who can save them from all the bitterness and hurts of life, from their sin. God, there is one who hung on a tree in their place. Would you give them eyes to look even this morning and believe and treasure the Lord Jesus Christ? And I pray for the younger who are prideful and arrogant and have never been brought to their knees. They don't have room for anybody. God, I pray this morning that they would look to that Savior or that you would save those who are are prideful, just needing Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you as a Savior, and we want you put on display as a saving God. Lord, let the church do what you've designed by the power of your Spirit to begin to, to pour into one another, that we would begin to see things that, that will just put you on display, and the world will take notice, and they'll want to know, what is, the, what is it? You have a saving God at Southside. We want to know him. How can we know him? God, let that be the fruit and the aroma of this body. God, let us not accept coming, hearing a sermon, and leaving. Lord, don't let us fall for that lie. Your name's at stake. I pray, let this be every member giving our lives to the body of Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.